If you're using email to drive streaming, you are using a bazooka to kill a housefly. Like, <laughs> that's it. That's so good. That's so good. It's like, if you have a fly swatter, use that and let's save the bazooka for, you know, the tank. <laughs> you are now listening to the Creative Juice podcast brought to you by Indopreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice Podcast. This is episode 191, and it is October. So it's time to get spooky or something. <laughs> you ready to get spooky? I'm your host, Jack McCarthy. With me, as always, is your other host, Circa. And today we're going to scare you guys with email marketing. Yep, it's, uh, it's pretty terrifying. We're going to dive into my email inbox and do a little bit of auditing, maybe pick on the music industry a little bit today, give you guys some better practices from some of the things that we're seeing in email land from artists that you know and love from the Billboard Hot 100 chart. This is kind of a follow-up from our episode where we audited the marketing of Billboard Hot 100 artists. Now we're going to get into email marketing and see where they could be doing better, and maybe it'll scare you guys. Maybe it won't. I don't know. I think you'll be surprised. Like if you're out there and you like look up to these artists who are topping the charts or whatever, or you at least admire their their hustle, maybe we can help you see what we see, which is like the glaring inefficiencies in terms of the stuff that actually makes them money. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. I think this is going to be fun. We'll pick on a few different emails. I'm going to just choose a few at random, some that I've kind of curated for this episode as well. And we'll point out some general principles and ideas and things that we think could be better. And some things that, you know, I actually think are pretty okay and could just be bumped up maybe a little bit. And if you're on the teams of any of these artists that we talk about, let us know what you think. We'd love to hear from you. <laughs> to help you make more money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'd love to help you make more money. Let's get right into it here. Let me pick one out. All right, gang, here's the first one. It's an email from Ariana Grande. Came into my inbox on August 31st. Do you know what was around August 31st, Cirque? My birthday? <laughs> that is around your birthday. Yes. Not what I was thinking of. August 31st was right around Labor Day weekend. Okay. Maybe a little Labor Day sale? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe it would have been. This isn't, though. This isn't. So Thursday, August 31st. For those of you guys who know a lot of what we do, when retail holidays come around, we help our artists at the agency and in Indie Founder, our coaching students, we help them try to pick up revenue that's missing in their business. And retail holidays are great opportunities to do it because everybody else in the world is running sales at that time too. So maybe you should. But here's an email from Ariana Grande that has nothing to do with Labor Day at all. And big missed opportunity here. That's why I wanted to lead off with this one. So this is a thank you for celebrating hashtag 10 years of yours truly, the record. And it's selling a 10th anniversary edition, a picture disc vinyl. It's a graphic heavy email, all graphics. There's a big blue background. There are some video embeds. There's not a whole, there's, there's multiple calls to action asking you to watch these videos with some live performances. Uh, there's a merch collection that's flipping through different products, t-shirts, tank tops, hats, there's a few other things in here. There's the vinyl at the very top where you can shop for that. So multiple calls to action in this email. Very, very, very little copy. Big, bold headline, Ariana Grande, yours truly, 10th anniversary. Here's the body copy of the email. It says, 10 years of yours truly. Thank you for everything. Always, Ari. Interesting that such a sentimental moment would come with such little messaging. And that's the first thing that I want to pick on for this is, and I see this in artist emails all the time, that they really don't tell their fans anything in their emails. It's usually these heavy, graphic heavy emails that have multiple calls to action. So people don't really know what to do. It's kind of like a choose your own adventure free for all and not in a good way. Um, and that's really what this email represents to me. Yeah, so an interesting little factoid about most music industry emails is that, just like Jack said, they're image heavy, meaning they're HTML heavy. They're coded emails. They're not plain text. Like if Jack were to send me like an email from Gmail, goes to my inbox, it's pretty much plain text. 
HubSpot did a study in 2015 that's still relevant today where they surveyed people and asked, what format do you prefer to receive email messages from, you know, brands? And most people said HTML. Most people said mostly image instead of mostly text. So HTML with mostly images was people's preferences. And HubSpot thought, okay, uh, what's the responsibility? Like HTML emails just perform far worse. So what is this? Is this a deliverability issue? HTML emails are not actually reaching the people who do want to see them. Turns out that wasn't the case. Deliverability is the same for image-heavy HTML emails as it is for plain text. So it gets to the inbox, but open rates are lower and click-through rates are lower, despite people saying that they would actually like that format. So people tend to just not actually like it that much, and it massively impacts open rates and click-through rates. And with every additional HTML element you add, like a new image or a, a specific font or something like that, you decrease the open rate, sometimes by up to 20% or more. So all record label and music industry emails are just big images. <laughs> <laughs> That's all they usually are. Uh, images with images on top of them. So, um, so yeah, like they could be massively increasing their open rates, massively increasing their click-through rates. And then with plain text, you don't have any images to back up the fact that you're not saying anything, as Jack had mentioned. So maybe it'd behoove them to just go plain text from now on. <laughs> I love those stats. And I love that. I love that HubSpot study. And yeah, it's so good. If I can find that, we'll link to it in the show notes. Because yeah, that's it's super interesting, and it's a conversation that I have with artists often. Um, and I think you can find a middle ground here, right? Like you can include some imagery, your logo, maybe if you want in your emails. If you wanted to include photos, like we're not saying like, I mean, I'm saying be totally plain text because personally, it just works better. But that's just me. And if you want to, you know, fit somewhere in a middle ground, like. I'm not going to, you know, be looking over your shoulder to stop you. Yeah, at Entrepreneur, we send designed HTML emails with images, but we started off all plain text, and I still send plain text emails when I'm doing our email. I tend to prefer it more. It cuts through the noise. Doesn't mean you have to, like, go full plain text, but the more you do, the better you'll do, it seems. Yeah. Now, here's something interesting that I wanted to touch on, just sort of zoomed out high-level strategy when it comes to this email campaign in particular. It's interesting that this launched around Labor Day because on one hand, they did launch seemingly a product, a new offer, right around a retail holiday. Cool, nothing wrong with that. Actually, I think that that's not a bad strategy, but they didn't even recognize the fact that there was that sales period going on. And I think for future strategies, something to keep in your back pocket is like leverage those opportunities, talk about them because it's already in the minds of your audience. They're looking for those shopping opportunities. So for you to just come out and say, you know, thanks for celebrating 10 years of yours truly. If you talked a little bit about Labor Day, you might've caught the people who are thinking in that mode and not necessarily looking for your, you know, album anniversary in that very moment. They might, you know, they're probably in, they're, they're in sales shopping mode. So talk about it, leverage it. You can say that your, you know, your cool new offer is launching on the holiday, on Black Friday, at Christmas, on Memorial Day, whatever it is, all of that is great. That's actually really good. Like, I would love if everybody did launch new offers around their <laughs> around the holiday periods. It's great. It's a great strategy to do rather than just doing like plain bullshit discounts. But no mention of that here. And I think that that's a strategic missed opportunity. I'll say that in lieu of a business holiday that we can rest on, like Labor Day, we will make one up. 502s have 502s day. They made it up, but they celebrate it every year and they run a sales promo on it every year. But in this case, they did have that holiday. And I'll say this, 10-year anniversary of an album, important to the artists and their family and team, not so important to a fan. Not that the album's not important, just the 10-year anniversary of it is not that important. I would say Labor Day has a bit more oomph to it than this sort of arbitrary, you know, round number years since we released this album. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. We'll follow up on this specific point a little more as we dive into a few more of these emails, but I got one email about this. Yeah, that's not great. Just on the 31st. Yeah, it's like presuming that everyone who would buy this is going to open this one email 
and that people who didn't open this, because some people would say, well, we don't want to piss people off. And it's like, all right, you're assuming that people who didn't open this email will know about it when they open the second one and they'll be mad that they got the first one. It's like, they didn't open it. So they won't be mad because they don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to pick at this point a little bit more because there's a few other artists that I think had some missed opportunities, specifically around Labor Day as well. So we'll get into that in a minute. But I want to I want to dive into a next one. And Cirque, I think you're going to love this. It's an excruciating pain point for us and spooky across the internet all the time in every kind of artist post, ad, email, what have you, website, is an email that I got from Nicki Minaj on September 1st. So the next day, again, you know, Labor Day weekend's coming up, but there's nothing about that in here. This email is, here's the subject line, drum roll, Last time I saw you, out now. The single has dropped. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My favorite two words in all of music marketing, out now. Yeah, I love it. So opening up this email, hey, a little bit better. Opening up this email, more text. Actually, fairly heavily plain text. There's a decent amount. We've got Nicki Minaj logo sort of typeface going on here. And then we have body copy. I can't thank you enough for your love and continued support. I've not been excited about the release of this song to this extent for maybe, I don't know, I can't even tell you. So here's the artist actually telling a bit of a, a story. I'm actually positively stoked about that. Really cool. I know it has nothing to do with Labor Day. I know that it's, you know, out now is not newsworthy and is boring. And definitely all the fans on her email list already knew this anyway. But cool that there's a little bit of storytelling behind why she's reaching out, you know? Yeah, it is. If we were to rank order the groups of your fans in order of like how much they need to know something's out now, it's like people who aren't your fans people who are your fans but haven't bought from you and aren't on your email list, people on your email list, and then your customers. Like, And the bottom half, they know. They've signed up for your freaking email list. They really care about you. <laughs> they know your music's out. <laughs> if they're on your website or they've ever been on your website, they definitely know your music's out. They care enough to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I wanted to pick on this a little bit more to say... I think here's the pivot that could have been made with this email, right? Instead of having a subject line that is song title out now, if you scroll through this email, what we're seeing is like this heartfelt message from Nicki Minaj, cool, some photos, there's a listen now call to action, and then below the listen now call to action, which again, the fans have probably already done this, <laughs> you've got the merch collection for last time I saw you. What would have been cool to do here, in my opinion, is instead of making this email about the song being out now, change the subject line to something that's actually curiosity driven. Here, here's like a stupid example. I'm just pulling this out of thin air. Why last time I saw you is the most impactful song for me this year or something like that. Why last time I saw you is the most meaningful song to me. Why I care more about Last Time I Saw You than any other song I've written. Now, I don't know if any of those are true, but for a fan that's on your email list, that's probably going to perk their ears up and get them to open faster. What was the name of the song? Last Time I Saw You. Better email subject line by itself. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. That's so true. Song titles can be better subject lines than anything that has out now in it. Nicki Minaj sent me an email saying, last time I saw you dot, 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 I'm going to open it. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> You're thinking, dude. You're thinking. What I was going to say was, we've got this heartfelt message, right? Could include that. Instead of the listen now call to action, in that body copy where you're talking about how much this song means to you and why you're more excited about it than previous releases or the most excited that you've been about it compared to you know your last drop get into the fact of why you made merch around this single release and then use that as a transitional point to then make the calls to action around the merch instead of just sending people over to Spotify so then you can kind of contextualize and prioritize why you're telling them a story what you're telling them why it matters and is related to the song and how the merch is all tied into it and why making the merch came as a 
a consequence of caring so much about this song. And then you can say it's limited edition, it's cool. I've only got this many of you know these things, this collection. Please go check it out. It would mean the world to me. And then the call to action is about merch. It's revenue generating. That's what email marketing is really good for. And that's the missed opportunity here, I think. Yeah, if you're using email to drive streaming, you are using a bazooka to kill a housefly. (laughs) That's it. That's so good. That's so good. It's like, if you have a fly swatter, use that and let's save the bazooka for, you know, the tank. (laughs) I think this is going to be a fun next one. I'm actually not even going to open this email. I want us to just talk about the strategy behind the email because I got an email from Shakira on September 18th that said, last chance to get your hands on the Iconic Looks collection. I have never gotten any emails from Shakira before that last chance email. (laughs) Wait, so there was no opening of the sale? No. How long ago did you opt in? Uh, When would that, when have I opted? The summer, right? Yeah, I opted in in the summer. So unless this promo ran for like many, many months, like there was no first chance. Hold on, let me look. Although it's an interesting presumption to make to say like, well, Given that people don't open every email anyways, maybe they'll just think that they missed it. I've So I subscribed to Shakira's email list in April, at the end of April, and I got a number of single release emails, out now emails. There might, be, there might have been some merch emails that in here that I deleted, but I definitely never got an email about the Iconic Looks collection. And it's also like scarcity works once you've done your job to make me care about the thing that is scarce. Yeah. I don't even know what it is right now. I don't even know what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think that's an interesting use case of maybe missing the opportunity to introduce the product, remind me about it, and then close the doors and make it urgent and scarce, potentially. It's just kind of lazy. Yeah, yeah. Because email's like free to send the emails. You're storing the contacts that month anyways. Might as well send more emails. For sure. This is actually, that's a perfect transition point, actually, that I wanted to get into as we go into a few more. There was a few email campaigns that I got over Labor Day weekend that I think kind of give us an opportunity to talk about email marketing cadence and frequency, because it's something that artists are afraid to overdo, I think unnecessarily, especially around holiday promotions, sales promotions. Like I said, I didn't get any more emails from Ariana Grande about the 10 years of yours truly, but I got a couple interesting sales promo emails around Labor Day weekend by folks like Kane Brown and Jordan Davis. And I wanted to talk about those. Kane Brown, I got a 20% off Labor Day weekend sales promo email, and he sent a follow-up three days later, which is cool. And that was kind of the whole of that. So it was 20% off. That was kind of like the doors opening for the sale. And then I got a happy Labor Day, which was a reminder. Jordan Davis, he did a $5 or less collection for Labor Day, which is kind of cool. I don't see offer, I don't see that offer out there all that much from artists. So I thought that that was kind of neat. Good on you guys. Um, maybe didn't make you the most money, but I hope it did. Um, <laughs> I really, I really hope it did. But on August 31st, I got a $5 or less subject line. Shop the Labor Day sale while supplies last. Cool. All right. Dope. Then on September 4th, I got the $5 or less sale ends tonight. We opened and closed the sale. That's already a market improvement from the last one. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> And this is why I wanted to talk about cadence is like, there's a lot you can do in between the opening and the closing of the sale. And I think that this is something that artists that are household names, major label artists, artists with huge fan bases, and you guys, anyone who's listening to this can learn here is like, you can do more than just open the sale and then close the sale, or you can do more than say, here it is and last chance. You can give context on what you're selling in between. You can tell people stories. You can just check in with them and say what's up and include in the PS section a quick reminder. You can give customer reviews or share social proof from your fans. You know, like if people are flooding to your store and buying stuff and they're excited about it and they're commenting on your posts or your ads or they're replying to your emails, share that with the people that haven't bought from you yet or maybe didn't open the first email. And you've got so much opportunity to leverage here. And I think that's the big 
thing that I recognized over the Labor Day sales period that folks were missing out on. It was like, if you were selling something, I was seeing like a maybe announcement and maybe a closing, but that was pretty much it. Nothing in between. So just in terms of this topic specifically, just a quick tip for those of you out there doing email marketing, especially if you have a big list or you have a lot of stuff to sell. It's like opening a sale is actually, to me, two emails because you have an announcement and then you have a like, hey, in case you missed it, where you're summarizing the announcement points in bullet points. So that way you're getting it out quicker and more digestible and it's catching people who didn't open the first one. So that's opening. Opening is at like possibly two emails, it would be better if you did two. Then you have content, which can be two, three, four emails where you're giving them content that is tangentially related to the sale. So if what you're offering, there's a piece of content that implicates it, then, you know, like let's say for instance, you're offering a limited edition vinyl of an album you did, and then you have a piece of content on your YouTube that's from that album or related to it. Then you're sending that out and using it as an excuse to remind them about the sale. On this topic, you know, like, I just wanted to send you this in case you hadn't seen it yet. This is from this album. This is the album we're doing a limited edition vinyl run on right now that you can grab. Here's the link. So your your content is the purpose of the email, and it doesn't have to be new content. It doesn't have to be a new release, because chances are, like, not every fan has seen everything you've ever done. So you can show them this content, tie it to the sale, and then you have FAQs, which is an oft underused email excuse during a promo, is you take any potential objections to the sale, or you take any potential like just customer supporty questions, you know, what, how long should I expect shipping? Does this discount apply to this? You put those in the email and you answer all those questions in the email and then link out. And then you have closing and closing is often two emails. Closing is like last day and then like final hour kind of stuff. Yeah. So, you know, you're looking at a potential up to 10 emails you can send over the life cycle of a promo. And if you're saying like to yourself, well, my promo is only seven days. That's like more emails than there are days. Like, won't people get pissed off? And it's like, no, people on average will only open one or two of those emails. They'll only see one or two. And that's not a bad thing. It's just something to be aware of. That's, a, that's one of the benefits of email marketing yeah. as opposed to text marketing, where they'll right. open everyone and will get pissed if it's more than a sentence, you know? Absolutely. I think that that's a really good point to make, especially like it shows the work that goes into maximizing email as a channel. And it's hard work. It's not easy. But the opportunities are there. So it's either you see them and know about them and choose to do it, or you don't know about them <laughs> and you choose not to, or you know about them and choose to do nothing, which leaves you with you know an opening and a closing email and a whole bunch of money left on the table. Here's an interesting, we were talking about this actually at the NDX team meeting today. And this is the last point I'll make on this, this topic of how to close your sales promotions. Two interesting stories. One, one of our account managers, Indiex strategist, Shay, she was telling me that for a few of our clients, she was seeing as much as 40% of the email-related sales coming from the last chance emails that were being sent. So in one instance, she was negotiating with a client about even sending a last chance email they didn't want to. And she was like, no, we need to. You're going to miss out on sales. And now in the future, she can say, you're going to miss out on 40% of your sales. Exactly, which was really interesting. And another interesting story came from Andy Hunter, one of our strategists, and he was specifically working on a promotion for his band. And this is fascinating. He was actually getting his merch printed and was putting an order in. And the people that he was ordering from were like, oh man, like if you order 10 more, he had pre-sold these and he was putting the order in. He was like, oh man, if you order 10 more, you'll get a price break. It would really make sense for you guys to to do that, but he didn't have the order volume to do it. And he was like, all right, like, let me think about it. Like, let me see how many more I can sell. Mind you, this had gone on for, this was something that they had been selling as a, as a pre-sale offer for months, I believe at this point, he said, and he was like, okay, I'm, let me see what I can do. And I'll get back to you in two days. Sent out a final last chance email, a final call and got 60 more sales. <laughs> wild, wild to me. He was like, yeah, I just learned the, I learned the last chance email uh, lesson all over again for myself. 
It was hilarious. I thought it was perfect timing for him to bring that up today so that we could talk about it here on the show. And so, yeah, when people look at like, because we meet with like artists and their management, the question comes up all the time, like, what is the size of the opportunity? What are we missing out on? What inefficiencies exist? And it's like, even if you're doing things really well, quote unquote, just one of these inefficiencies meant 40% right? It meant 60 more orders in a, in a single email. Like that, that's the scope of the, of the hole that's caused by these inefficiencies. For sure. Yeah. I'll leave us with this last email that came from Doja Cat. Not the best. Definitely room for improvement here, gang. And the spookiest one of the bunch, which is why I saved it for last. Scarlet is here was the email that I got on September the 14th. And when you open it, it's Doja Cat in black and red, red background, black lettering. Scarlet is here is the copy. And then there's a very scary photo in which looks like someone covered in blood and a button that says go. And that's it. (laughs) That's the email. And what does it go to? A folded up tracing of a hammerhead shark. It goes to a website page, scarletishere.com, with a video on it of someone walking through a woods with like a Blair Witch style handheld camera with a light on it in the dark. And I don't know where it's taking me. And I've been on this page for about 30 seconds now. Not sure what's going to happen with it. But yeah, this was the email. Definitely, definitely scary. Definitely not great. I would imagine that this is like a teaser anticipating an album or like a release. That's what I would imagine. And it's like, it's one thing to use email to not make revenue, but to promote something you just released. It is 10 times worse to use it for teasers. Like that's pure social strategy. It's not email strategy. Accurate. Accurate. Yeah, Yeah, I agree. So yeah, this video is still playing. I don't really know what it's doing for me. It just showed a red high heel shoe in the video. I I think that has something to do with Scarlet. This email genuinely terrified me when I opened (laughs) it and that's why I saved it. But yeah, I I couldn't agree with you more, Cirque. It's like email as a communication channel for revenue generation is great. For, you know, calls to action towards things that are actually released, great. For teasers, you're better off giving your fans in email more insight than the general public is getting on social. 100%. Yeah, if if it's pre-release content and it has no revenue attached to it, it should be nurturing. It should be like you, because you're on this email list, get things other people do not. For sure. To the degree of which, like, this could have even been an email the day before Scarlet is here that was like, hey, tomorrow I'm going to be dropping something on Instagram. You might want to keep your eyes out. Help me get the word out. Yeah, help me get the word out. Totally, yeah. Yep, referral strategy. Yeah. That's the kind of thing where you can then utilize, email then becomes a channel where you can do something different versus just doing the same thing across all of your channels, which I think that's kind of what this fell into is like, okay, Scarlet is here. We're going to roll it out on Facebook. We're going to roll it out on Instagram. It's going on TikTok. Definitely going to say the same thing in email and everywhere else. Yeah. You can use email as a differentiator because you can speak one-to-one with people. Yeah. It's interesting to think about like the agencies that must be behind this stuff or perhaps even the interns who might be behind this stuff. Ooh. Ooh, <laughs> that's on God. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, like the agencies that exist in the music industry are, are sort of purpose built for like uh, publicity and streaming. Like that's really what they're geared towards. That's their sales offer. That's like their proposition. And, and it's apparent in the email strategy. Like it's obvious that that's the case. But if only they knew what riches lie just beyond a little bit of education on email marketing. Yeah. I think we can close with that. That's what I got in this audit for you guys today. Hope you dug this. Hope it wasn't too terrifying. Hope you can sleep well tonight. And (laughs) hopefully you take some lessons from this about email marketing and things that you could be doing differently. Maybe take some of the cool things that some of these artists were doing. Shout out to Jordan and his team with the $5 collection sale. I thought that was kind of neat. Good job, guys. This was fun. I enjoyed this. Hell yeah. Well, if you want more email marketing strategy, including top to bottom, and when we say, I just wanted to make this last point, the industry benchmark for email, when you're doing email marketing correctly and you're running consistent sales promos as a business, the industry, like across all industries, benchmarks are $1 to $2 of revenue per email subscriber per month, as reported by HubSpot. 
And this is what we mean when we say all these little nuances we've gone over in this episode, that's what two spec email marketing is and consistent sales promos go along with that. But if you're doing that, that's what you should be getting. And that's not what most artists are getting per email subscriber by a long shot. And so if you want to learn two spec email marketing for artists, join Indie Pro. We have like three courses on it. <laughs> we care a lot about it. Yeah. Well, I hope you guys dug this. We'll catch you next time on Creative Juice. And while we're wrapping up today, you are listening to Indie Award winner, Amanda Duncan. Woohoo! Who is also the Creative Juice editor extraordinaire. Yeah. This is her song, Tell You What I'm Gonna Do. I hope you guys dig it. We'll see you next time. Peace out, Amy. If you wanna know the play by play, yeah.